Hello, it's me, Sandy Joy Weston. I cannot believe that in just a few short weeks, I'm coming up on my 100th episode of Let's Keep It Real, thanks to you. I cannot even imagine what the next 100 episodes are gonna be like. So many great interviews with awesome people making such a positive, powerful difference in the world. I get some exciting new things planned for us. But one of the things that blew my mind was, I cannot believe, in all these episodes, when I was going back, somebody pointed this out to me too. I never said subscribe to my podcast, like my podcast, share my podcast, rate my podcast. Yes. It is written there, but I never have asked for it. So here's the deal. I am beyond blessed for being able to do this podcast. I learn so many new things each and every time. I believe you will have fun, laugh, and go away with so many new tidbits. So yes, I would love if you would share my podcast, subscribe to my podcast, like my podcast, rate my podcast, and of course, send me all your questions, what you want to see, what you want to hear, what new guests you want, what topics do you want me to highlight? I would love to know. You can do it behind the scenes or on the scenes. You can actually be one of my guests. So, I thought this would be a great time to start this new beginning with my awesome guest from Australia. Her name is Alice Frazier. You're going to freaking love this woman. I was blown away by our talk together and I was honored my friend Dan Schneider made the connection that she came on my show. I can't wait for you to listen. Anything you want to say, please send it my way. Questions for her, you can reach out to questions at sandyjoyweston.com. So I'm gonna let you enjoy. Have fun. This is Let's Keep It Real with Sandy Joy Weston, your weekly dose of positivity with awesome stories and guests from all over the world. It's an opportunity to learn some great new things and expand your mind. We'll tackle topics from all areas of life, and as always with Sandy, the sky's the limit. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Florence Belsky Charitable Foundation, which was founded in 2003 by Florence Belsky, a pioneer, attorney, mentor to many, and positive aging activist. The foundation's main programs are First Mondays, Women Who Lunch, and Pick Three, a virtual mentoring program which connects advisors. The foundation has over a thousand global advisors of all ages and has hubs in all major U.S. cities, as well as international cities all over the world. The foundation has been developing virtual resources to help people during the current pandemic on its website, www.flowbellangels.org. The latest program is a virtual woman's network called Women Who Lunch 2.0. For more info on that, see www.flowbell.org. Hello, hello, my let's keep it real people. If you've been listening to me, you know I'm so excited. I can't believe she's finally here. But before I bring her on, let me just tell you a little bit about her, which there's so much more. This is the shortest thing I've ever seen for somebody who's done so much. This week's awesome, inspiring guest is Alice Frazier from Australia. Alice is an award-winning podcaster. Ooh, I got a little nervous about that. And comedian, an ex-lawyer, and ex-academic. She has a special, which is incredible, I hope we talk about it, Savage, available on Amazon Prime in a, this is hysterical, a daily satirical news podcast set in an alternate dimension. Alice, thank you so much for being here. 
Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, we were sitting here and I'm, lo I'm looking at your takeaway tips. And the first thing it says is fail as often as possible. And I'm thinking we were having technical <laughs> difficulties. So what a way to show up. Fail as often as possible. So I like to start out my show. By the way, I love the way you start your shows out. What are you drinking? I think it's <laughs> awesome. And I'm not just saying it, but I always, always drink tea. It's very soothing to my throat. So yeah, that's my uh, Tea with Alice podcast. I, I'm, I always find it fascinating what, what kind of teas people drink. Well, what I find fascinating is you take this little subject and I listen to some of the people and all of a sudden they're telling you what they drink and you're on to a whole new subject. It's amazing how one little thing can take you down the road. And I do agree with you. As much as it's awesome to do it like this, there's nothing like sitting across the table sharing a cup of tea. I mean, you get. I mean, this was the thing when I was doing the podcast because uh, when I started it, I had no goal in mind for it. I just wanted to see if I could do it as a project, and I was interested to see what it would turn out to be. Oh. And I thought, what what is the most me thing? And my favorite thing in the world is sitting down with someone, and tea sort of lasts as long as you want it to. You can True. just keep refilling the pot, and you start talking about something, and in the end, you're talking. You can talk for hours about any range of subjects and you can be really vulnerable. And for me, the favorite conversations I used to have over tea were the ones where people would say, I, oh, I'm not sure about this, or I'm, I'm changing my mind about this, or every one of my friends believes this thing, but I, I can't get on board with it. Those really vulnerable conversations where you're not sure if you're thinking right or, or if mm. you've got something together in your head. And I think that is really missing in the public discourse at the moment. Everyone's so certain of themselves and so unwilling to to change their minds about it. When was the last time you saw anyone on television or radio or mm -hmm. any Good forum point. go, actually, I'm not sure. Now that I say that out loud, I'm, I'm actually not sure. You just never see it. No, and actually, Dan Schneider, we were talking about how I came to you, who I shout out to Dan. I love the dude who's now in California. He goes back and forth between New York and California. Uh, we were just talking about, Dan, is it possible for me to get somebody on who has a totally different view from me politically? I'm not a political person, Alice, at all, but <laughs> I do care about the world I live in. And so I thought, is it possible for me to bring on people that have totally different views that can be civil and I can actually listen to them and learn something? And there was this huge discussion that started within my family of my father-in-law saying, yes, you have to listen to the other side to learn versus my son who's 17 is like, why would you give them a platform? And so we're going back and forth on it. So I would love to know your opinion. I think that's incredibly important. And this is, I think, well, one of the one of the problems now is that because we don't know most of the people we're talking to and we're not sitting across from them with a cup of tea in hand and that kind of implicit understanding that we're all friends here and you can, you can say things uh, that aren't going to be made public that their views don't reflect on you in some way that there is there's this yeah. odd odd feeling nowadays that exposing yourself to ideas that you disagree with in some way corrupts you mm -hmm. and you see this with sort of censorship of books or texts on both sides of politics uh, if, if politics can be said to have two sides but what, there's this idea <laughs> that by reading a book you're sort of bringing it into you. And this is a, a from an article that Jonathan Haidt wrote, H-A-I-D-T. He writes some really interesting articles, but he presented this idea that when you read a, a bad, quote-unquote, bad book that's on the opposite side from you, uh, mm -hmm. that you're bringing it into yourself and that there is a corruption that occurs as a result, rather Ooh. than seeing, for example, a problematic historical text or whatever as a, a place that you journey to like a time traveler you go into the book and you learn from it and then you come back out and you're not polluted or corrupted or and you see that that idea of sort of pollution I think is very dangerous you should yeah. be able to engage with even disgusting ideas and think about them and examine them and and yeah. then take a step back and and remain yourself not damaged by them no, and my point was, by the way, it's my father-in-law who was debating the best with everyone. He's 87, and he said, Sandy, I think you should try it because I know you. 
even through all the mix of everything, you might find one pearl wisdom and say, ah, oh, I understand that. Now I get their way of thinking. And how can I grow unless I do that? I, I, I don't know. It, we're still going back and forth on it, but there has to be a way, Alice. And you do it through comedy. Oh my, first of all, let's back up a second. <laughs> let's back up. I can't believe I just found you. I'm so pissed off because I love comedy. I mean, I'm, I joke around, but I'm not someone to get up on stage. I just laugh a lot. And I've always dealt with the most <laughs> difficult situations. Like if someone was throwing a plate at me, I would say, oh, it's going to improve my arm for baseball. Like I always found the humor <laughs> of it. And I think it's just the way I deal with life, you know, always. I have a tendency to think you're the same way. It's interesting. Day to day, I'm I'm relatively serious, but I have always used really? comedy to. Um, so I'm sort of not. I'm not a class clown. I'm not a joker. I love to laugh, but I have always used comedy to ease situations. My mom was sick while I was growing up, and obviously, some of the results of that were sort of public embarrassment where oh. everyone is uncomfortable. Some, something's happened with mum and it's embarrassing for her, it's embarrassing for the people around you, yeah. and you, you, you have to make it okay. I felt that very much, and that was a, an easy way to make it okay because it takes... Comedy is such a unifying thing. If you're laughing with people, for that one moment, you know that your minds are in the same place. And as a, as a comedian, that's the thing that I see as my job in comedy there's so many different kinds of comedy of course yeah yeah, but what yeah. I love to do or what I want to do is to make people feel human and make them aware of the humanity of the people around them and it's this incredible thing one of my favorite feelings in the world is having an idea where you know where you get a light bulb moment yeah you suddenly realize something that's my favorite feeling and in comedy if you can find the right words and the right rhythm you can give other people that idea and you can watch them feel them get it you can watch that idea happen and you know it's worked because they laugh mm. it's an incredible thing that you know you have you know a hundred people in a room and their minds are all on that beat in yeah. that moment with you and with that joke or with that idea it's oh, a phenomenal feeling well i felt like i came home sister because that's me and people always say sandy why do you do that i go it I guess it makes me feel better. Uh, I want to lighten up the situation. I want to deliver strong information, but then laugh about it. And you had me on such a roll. First of all, you talk about your mom on the show, and next minute you're playing the banjo, and then we're all humming along. It, uh, by the way, I was humming, just so you know, sitting here, Good. I was humming. Yeah. Good. That is the right response. And then I've got it. chills, and then I'm crying. First of all, people, if you haven't seen Savage on Amazon Prime, please, I beg of you. Go do it immediately. I know you're, this. it's gonna skyrocket. It's just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger. And I think it's only been out like two months or something, unless yeah. I've missed the boat. No, it, it has. It's been out for a relatively brief time. Weirdly enough, my the sequel to Savage has been on Amazon Prime in like some places for a couple of years now. And oh. so to have the first show come out afterwards it's all very complicated and and time time space continuum -y. but yeah savage is ha, is sort of the big one that amazon produced themselves and and put out and and it's yeah it's it's really wonderful to have it out in the world i was really nervous um that it wouldn't be um that the the filming of it wouldn't communicate the intimacy of that show yeah. as a live show yeah, but I, I think it, it has. Oh my gosh, it did. It so did. And I think it, the timing, ugh, the universe is lined up for you. So <laughs> let's let's talk about that a little because my number one question and my son said, Mom, you've got to ask her, how long did it take her to put that show together? Like, what was your process? Well, so my process <laughs> out of the gate was to cancel the show. Uh, oh. <laughs> what, Okie dokey. So my mum had been sick for a long time. I was working as a comedian. Things started to come to a head in terms of her prognosis. And when they told us it was terminal, I had this uh, preview show booked in at the Sydney Comedy Festival. And it was, you know, coming up to the time and I didn't have a show. I couldn't write anything. I was so, so miserable and so kind of just full of this knowledge of... of you know, impending death. I couldn't write comedy. Yeah. And 
I called the Sydney Comedy Festival and I will always be grateful to uh, Shane Smith, who was an administrator there. I still remember his name. I called him. I said, I have to cancel. The show's in two weeks. I haven't got a show. My, my mum's dying. And he said, you can cancel until five minutes before the show. We'll just refund everyone's tickets. Don't don't cancel. Uh-huh. Just, just, you know, relax. Don't think about it. And... Uh, you can let us know until five minutes before the show. And I didn't have a show, and I didn't have a show, and, I, and then I had this encounter that I describe in the show with the, with the well-meaning young man, and it, it filled me with rage, which was not an accustomed emotion for me. And in, in, since then I've come to realise that, you know, sometimes when you're, if, you, if you're very sad or you have too much of any emotion it sort of overflows into the other buckets yes yes (laughs) um but I was so sort of astonished by that sensation and I went home and I wrote this I wrote this story the whole story of why you know why him saying that had made me so angry and what it was and all these things I wrote this very angry and sad story and then I printed out all of the jokes that I was working with at the time, all the stand-up jokes that I had in the bank and all everything. And then I stood on stage with the story on my left hand and the jokes on my right hand. And the calculus in my head was, how many jokes do I need to give you before I can punch you in the face? Oh, with- my God. <laughs> the other side you know what, what, yeah, what yeah. how much do I need to give you to make you listen to this to make you understand this because people don't want to hear it they want to get get over that hump as quickly as possible of, of talking about something really difficult and, and painful yeah people don't want to talk about sadness they don't want to it's it's too they, no. maybe they fear they'll be dragged down into the pit so making them feel safe enough making sure that you know that there's a joke around the corner um, for me, that that was the process, just going between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Because the other thing was, I couldn't make fun of it. So some yeah. people make light of, of terrible things, and that's a yeah. really wonderful form of comedy you think yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, Mel Brooks making jokes about the Holocaust, an incredible thing. For yeah. me, it was too close. It was mm-hmm. too... I didn't want to make light of my mum's suffering. I didn't want to make light of... of the terrible things so the way I did it was like an old film where you put pictures so close to each other that they look like they're all of a piece uh, happy bit sad bit happy bit sad bit put, yeah, putting them yeah. closely enough together that while I'm never diminishing something by making a joke out of it you know there are enough jokes around it that it will lift uh, the mood yeah well I mean that is a true gift. I mean, that to me, the kind of comedy you did, that's why I said I was so impressed and I know it's just going to skyrocket. To me, it was one of the most difficult things you could ever do, yet so needed, especially now because everybody, you know, I don't care who you are, you have to have anxiety, stress, you know, anger, whatever, frustration about your situation, which leads me to the next question, which I think <laughs> I know the answer, but what is your number one way to chill when you feel stressed, anxious, overwhelmed? What do you do? Well, I mean, I have an, uh, it, it depends. Depends on your mood, like it's banjo, right? I'll have a cup of tea, I'll go for a walk, uh, I'll sit and breathe for a bit. Uh, yeah, nice, a nice long walk, or I'll bury myself in a book up a tree somewhere. No. <laughs> so... Wait, you'll bury yourself in a tree somewhere? Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll read a book in a tree. Yeah. I mean, I don't always read books in trees. I'll read a book somewhere, sometimes yeah. in a tree. No. <laughs> I, the two things I do, number one, I bike. I take my mountain bike, and sometimes if I'm in a bad mood, they'll just say, here, just go for a bike, and then come back and talk to us, and I'll bike and bike, but then I always find a tree, and the joke is, I talk to trees. Well, I do talk to trees, but I don't think they talk back to me. <laughs> I feel the energy from them. You know what I mean? Like you get that energy. I don't know if you feel it, but I feel like they have my back. I think it's a. I think it's an important thing to be able to talk to inanimate objects sometimes. You just go oh. scream into the ocean or something. Yeah, I just I love it. So, do you have uh, my thing? I don't. Do you ever hear of the word sticky wicken? What's your sticky wicken? 
Uh, no, I'm not a sticky sure. whip. Well, instead of saying what's your problem, what's going on there, pal? I'll say what's your sticky sticky wicket? Like, is there anything right now? Like, what's been the most challenging thing for you to deal with during this quarantine, and how did you overcome it? Or well, maybe you didn't. Uh, maybe I didn't. Well, I flew back to Australia from the UK. I have a flat in London, and I flew back for the uh-huh. or for the Australian comedy festivals, which were all promptly cancelled and then the country went into lockdown. I packed my suitcase for six weeks and I've been here now coming up on three months and Australia is locked down. It is illegal to leave the country. And on one hand, you know, the UK is not doing particularly well in terms of these virus stakes and Australia is doing well. Uh Um, But I didn't plan on this I didn't plan to be here yeah Uh, so there's this odd thing of well I'm on a I'm I'm chewing through data on my phone because I have a prepaid plan but do I get a contract because getting a contract it will be sort of admitting to myself that I'm going to be here for what three months six months a year how long is it going to be before do I keep paying rent on my flat in London how do I make plans for a future when the future is so uncertain I think that is my biggest struggle at the moment and I don't know that I have got over it but my yeah. twin brother is back here he flew out from London the same uh, the day after I did um, oh. for different reasons him and his wife and his his baby and my father is here so I'm if not solving the problem at least trying to focus on the good things which is being able to spend an enormous amount of time with my family yeah yeah which as an adult you don't always get to do Um, and being in Australia, which is a beautiful place, being near the beach, trying to, trying to focus on the good things. Yeah. Now, is your brother as funny as you? (laughs) Does he give you any material? Does your family give you material? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My brother is a very serious, my brother is like, um, a very sweet Hamlet. He's, he's. Okay. My brother is the genesis. I got that. My brother is the genesis of uh, the quote, why are all pleasurable things unethical? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Well, this must be quite a quarantine for you then. Oh, uh, he's he's one of the, I mean, obviously, my twin brother is is one of the best people in the world. He is an Mm -hmm. excellent and, and lovely human being, but he is... He has a tendency to be yeah. morose. <laughs> yeah. So growing up, did you get along? Or were you like always like this, funny? I think I saw something, where, it, maybe it wasn't you, that something about you found out there was no Santa. Was that you that I was watching a video of that you wrote? Yes, <laughs> yes oh. that was, that was uh, Santa Isn't Real. That, that was yeah. a, a piece of uh, comedy that I did back at the Cambridge Footlights. But, um, no, my brother and I always got on very well. Uh, I think we we brought each other up, really. Dad was working so very hard to support our family and uh, Mum was sick. She was a very, very loving mother, but, you know, she didn't have a huge amount of energy. So we just ran wild in the garden and um, looked after each other and were each other's confidants until you know even to this day to a certain extent of course you grow apart as you get towards the teenage years and you get your own friends and all of that sort of thing um but yes we still I think we've always gotten on well well where did you get your sense of humor from like were your parents are inspiration I think your dad was a lawyer your I I think you mentioned on the show your mom was a musician. So where did the comedy come in? Uh, I I do not know. I don't know. I wasn't... I love comedy. I love the the ideas of it. I, I guess I grew up on Monty Python and the mighty... Uh, Monty oh, Python and, yeah. and uh, the Goon Show on radio and very yeah. kind of classic British sketch comedy yeah, for the yeah. most part. And I always liked things that were funny. I was always drawn to funny writing, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, Georgette Heyer, Jane Austen to a certain extent. I, I was drawn to that kind of thing, but I never thought of being a comedian. And until... I never wanted to be a comedian <laughs> uh, until I got to university and there was a 
thing at O Week. I don't know if you have O Week, Freshers Week, you're at the first mm. week at you, where they have all the stalls and everything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's yeah. this thing called the 24-hour play in a day that was happening at the Sydney University Dramatic Society. And it was an improvised comedy show that went for 24 hours. And people would get slips of paper and they would go on stage and play a character. And it was very funny. And I took a slip of paper and I went on stage and... I was so bad. <laughs> okay. I was there comes so the bad. failure, fail as much I'm as possible. I was so bad. I still remember the full body shame prickles of just how bad I was. And I thought, you know, I've always been good at stuff. You know, when you have yeah. a sick parent, you don't want to rock the boat and, and you, want, you want to make sure that you succeed at things and, and you're either, you're talented, but being talented doesn't, mean anything in the real world (laughs) it actually doesn't the only thing that matters is if you can work and get better at something even if you are talented you you, that's true you you need to do the work and I was used to coasting I was quick and I could learn things quickly and that's all you really need to get through school so I was thinking maybe I don't know how to learn And here's something that is not part of my core identity. So if I fail at it, I don't feel like I'm a failure. Um, Fair enough. And so I started doing it and and got addicted to that process of getting better through failure. I think it's so important. I think it's so important for women particularly because, you know, just as a very broad generalisation, we tend to be quieter than boys growing up and we tend not to bounce off the walls as much and we tend not to learn that if you fail you are still loved that it's okay if you fail um, yeah. that that there are not, there's another way to get what you want if you don't get what you want the first time that that you don't need someone above you telling you that you're okay to take the next step in life that you can just do it and the only way to do it is to do it and then to fail and then to try again a different way and do it again and do it better we don't learn that as as people or particularly as women and I I, it became really important to me as well as that idea of of holding your identities loosely not uh, that's a, a Paul Graham essay that I read once which was that if you can you know, of course, you have some core identities, things that are just integral to who you think of yourself as. Yeah. But I don't think of myself as a comedian. I do comedy. So if somebody uh-huh. says to me, comedians are garbage, I can go, oh, that's interesting, rather than like, <laughs> how dare you? Right. I don't you, take that personally. Yeah. yeah I, and, and I mean, what is it to say I am a this, I am a anything, I'm a, I'm a feminist. Am I constantly being feminist? No. If if I am being a feminist, it's in getting up on stage in a male-dominated industry, and that's about that's about it. Yeah. Well, is that what were you bored? It sounds like well, you know, I got everything down. There's no challenge. I suck at this, so hey, I'm going to try it. I don't know. I don't. I, I mean, it was some time ago now, but I th- I really just remember thinking I need to learn how to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one of the questions, by the way, Dan wanted me to ask you, uh, because we are going to transcribe this for the Nectar News. Yeah. Like, how hard was it to pivot from lawyer to comedian? Which I didn't even know that's what you were going to school for. So, yes, I was. I did an, what they call an arts law degree uh, at Sydney University, which is where you, you do arts subjects, history, English, so on and so forth, and law. And I got my master's in English literature. And then I went and did my... Um, my master's in Cambridge and then I came back and finished my law degree and started at a top tier law firm uh, in Sydney and very quickly I realized that I would not fit in with the large corporate (laughs) legal environment there were you know a a few incidents that I could tell you about (laughs) one of which was that there's a frangipani tree outside my house, or there was where I used to live. Um, frangipanis are those beautiful sort of white flowers with the yellow core, and they smell very sweet. And mm. when I walked out to, to my first orientation day at this massive law firm, I picked a flower off the tree and I tucked it behind my ear without even thinking about it. Yeah. It's a nice thing to do. It was a nice summer's day. I went into 
work. Uh, we got our, you know, orientation of where everything was. We took our staff photos and then we went about our, our business. And about two months later, it dawned on me when somebody said, oh, Alice Fraser, you're the girl with the flower. That this, me wearing a flower behind my ear had been seen as this like immensely rebellious act. <laughs> How that, dare you? <laughs> well, that it was this like, whoa, she's de- that this, this, yeah. this just complete, they saw it as a statement and, and, and an aggression against the conformity of the law firm because everyone in a law firm is terrified. Everyone in a law firm is trying to make sure that they don't do what's called a career limiting move. So they, they're looking at the people above them and trying to behave in the way that the people above them behave because that's the only way you can be sure is okay to behave because the people above you seem to be doing it. Mm. But because observation is imperfect, because you're never going to be able to see all the different ways that they're allowed to behave, you necessarily limit down every rank, looking at the rank above it, does fewer and fewer things. So the people, particularly at the bottom, have no idea what they're allowed to do and are living in a state of constant fear, this weird sort of I, the career-limiting move that you'll never know what it is until you've done it. Just all, all, and that was just one of many other yeah. sort of weird psychological self yeah. repressions that were endemic to that kind of environment. That people are nobody seemed happy, and even if you looked at yeah. the people at the top, they didn't seem to be particularly yeah. happy either. Yeah, most, yeah, most of them are. Yeah. So, but comedy, you know what I mean? Like that's a tough profession, man. You get a tough one. <laughs> First of all, I mean, I'm a pretty brave soul, but it, and I do a lot of speaking on this, but to get up on stage, I mean, and not know if they're going to laugh and who your audience is, do you get like the heebie-jeebies every time you go up? No, no, I don't think I do. I, I, I will if my dad's in the audience or if my brother's in the audience, uh, but otherwise I don't, I'll get they, adrenalized, but I won't get nervous because really? at the by the time that I... I became a comedian I'd already done it for so long knowing that I was no good and knowing that it was just to see if I could be better next time and to notice the mistakes I was making or see why that didn't work it it was it was an interesting intellectual (laughs) project from from the beginning of like does this work no this works and you I learned and the great thing about that is that I have no imposter syndrome in comedy yeah. I know that I have worked for every single thing I have. Yeah. Because I know how bad I was. Well, yeah. So when did you turn the corner and you thought, I'm good, I'm damn good? Or did you ever feel that way? Like, yeah, I got it going on now. I think I always, mm, that's an interesting one. I think it was, ooh. When I, st- when I started doing sketch comedy, so I'd been doing improvised comedy for a while and then I started doing sketch comedy for the reviews, the university reviews, and somebody, I went in for an audition and somebody said, oh, you're Alice Fraser, you don't need to audition. <laughs> I've arrived! <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, I must have gotten good while I wasn't noticing. Because you don't notice. You don't notice <laughs> right. your growth. You, you're you always focusing on, you know, that's maybe the downside of this failure approach. You're always yeah. thinking, oh, well, what did I get wrong? What can I do better? That's an interesting thing. Oh, why did that work this time and not last time? Yeah. Or why did you... So I, I don't think I really noticed. And I think I'm still nowhere near as funny as I would like to be. Um... And I know that I am not, in many ways, what I offer in comedy is not primarily the laughs. Ah, you do. You do. I mean, the the, the laughs that are there. I I am. Yeah. I am yeah. funny, but yeah. uh, you know, there's boys. I remember them being surrounded by them when I was starting out. These just boys who would get a laugh before they even hit the mic. They're just funny people. Yeah. And I will. I was not that, and I will never be that. So I, I have to think about what I do, that is unique to me, that I can do better than anyone else, and that's what I bring to the stage. Well, for me, I love stories, and when you tell your stories, I'm captivated. Like, okay, what's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen? like the one of my favorites, and I don't want to spoil it, 
but was how you joined the track team just to meet the dude. <laughs> Yes. You're yes, delivering that's... that story. I'm going, okay, okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh, God. And then I'm sitting there. This is the weirdest thing. And I'm getting nervous for you on your date. You know what I mean? I don't know if people tell you that. Like, you can feel. <laughs> she didn't just say that. Oh, no, 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 Alice. Please don't just say that. I mean, it, your storytelling, I mean, is incredible. Forget the jokes, you know? Thank you. I mean, that's the job. I think when you're yeah. when you're telling, essentially, with when you write a show like that, a one hour show, and you perform it again and again, you're and particularly for me, that show meant a lot, and the stories in that show meant a lot. It was necessary every time to make sure that I was there. Yeah. Oh, it, you were there. <laughs> so the show is like the show is like a, a pl- plaster cast you've made of your <laughs> psychology at a particular moment in time. And there's a way you can do comedy where you're just kind of putting the plaster cast on the stage um, and sort of puppeting it from off stage. But the way that I like to do particularly that kind of show is you have to kind of press yourself back into that mold and step back into that shape and be there and, and really be there because it's an important thing to say. It's an important thing for you and it's an important thing that you think you can tell to the audience and to sort of just let it go on its own without being there seems wrong. I don't know if that's at all. I think that's very an abstract way of thinking about it. And I'm not sure if I've communicated my idea properly. Then. No, you, you, you did. It's, I'm thinking of me and my field and being, when I say be mindful and people are like, what the freak? I'm not mindful. Mindful. Stop it. It's having, like I say, all five senses, you know, and you have to be in that moment. And when you do that, it's magical. And when you bring your audience into it, especially virtually, I mean, that is incredible. And that's what I felt. And that's why when Dan said, I'm like, Dan, I don't know. This girl's an award-winning freaking podcaster. Like, <laughs> you want me to interview her? And then I watch Savage. I'm like, oh, damn, I got to get to know this woman. You know, and someday I will have tea. She could be in New York City. Who knows, you know? Like, yeah, come, to, you know? come to Sydney and I'll take you to my favorite tea shop. Well, let me tell you something. So when we are, like I do a lot of speaking engagements, when we are able to, my son has put little tacks on where we're going and Sydney is one of them because I have friends there too. And he's like, we got to go. So you'll be like, she actually showed up. I will <laughs> 100% take you for tea. I'm always up for a cup of tea. Yeah. All right, so. Here's the next thing. I got, I'm like, I could talk to you for hours, but I got to make sure I get a few of these things in. So Dan wants to know, do all lawyer, lawyers have a sense of humor like you? I know the answer <laughs> to that because I'm married to one. <laughs> uh, not all lawyers have a sense of humor like me. I think many lawyers, uh, the job of being a lawyer is inherently a, sort of a pessimistic one because often your job is to figure out everything that could possibly go wrong for your client that's your job to protect your client and I think that can lead in some people to a relatively negative mindset Uh, yeah I mean many of my friends they start out excited but they get burnt out you know it's it wears on them yeah well yeah there's the combination of it's a particular kind of work uh that doesn't suit everybody and there are some people who it does suit but often it's situated in these corporate hierarchies that i think are anti-human i don't think we'd be putting it too strongly i think they uh decrease the level of humanity in the world yeah it's it's tough it's really tough but i'm glad you made the switch all right now who are your influences I have, a, I mean, obviously my family to begin with. You've got to start small and, and go out from there. Uh, my family and my influences, just an immense number of absolute garbage sci-fi and fantasy novels. Um, <laughs> okay. In, in, in comedy, it would be probably uh, Monty Python and, and The Goon Show that. and uh, all of that kind of silly, funny British humour. Uh, as I said before, P.G. Woodhouse, who yeah. wrote the Jeeves and Worcester books, that very, um, the kind of comedy that enjoys itself, I think. So I was I was never massively drawn to the kind of angry comedy style. Yeah, yeah, me either. Do you have a comedian that you admire and you go, wow, 
that was a great performance or that you study to learn from? Um, not hugely. I, mm -hmm. I think I love a lot of comedians who are very different to me in part because I'm not analyzing what they're doing. I can just enjoy them. But uh, in terms of American comedians who you might recognize, people like Maria Bamford, uh, brilliant uh, Bo Burnham, um, yeah. Sarah Silverman. Yeah. Just, just anyone that does something that has an, an extra angle or makes you think. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Okay. What's one thing? I was supposed to ask you three, but I'll take one. What's one thing nobody knows about you that you can share with us? One thing that nobody knows about me that, that I can share with you. So this is an interesting thing. I, I partition off my life very carefully. I'm extremely open about some things and extremely closed about others. I will never talk about my personal relationships on stage um, oh. at all or in public at all. Uh, I, I don't usually talk about my brother on stage. He's asked me not to. So Ooh. there are, for, for somebody who go. appears very open on stage, it, there are huge chunks of my life that are yeah. off limits. Uh, and I, I think that's important if you have any kind of public voice. And I think it's something, again, that gets eaten away at by things like social media. But and it's a tough that, thing to do. That's a tough thing to do. But I, if I was dating you, I would be glad you weren't talking about me on stage. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, because oh, I've seen it. I've seen it go so badly. I've seen it go really well, where two comedians have broken up and both done the, the yeah. different shows about the same breakup at the same festival, and it's worked really well for them. Uh, although in the end, in this instance, one of them got the award and the other one didn't, which is a sort of a brutal indictment in many ways. I, what's something that nobody knows about me? That, that I can tell you. That you can tell me. Maybe it's a guilty pleasure, like a show that nobody knows you watch, or a food. I, I refuse to have guilty pleasures uh, in terms. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a pleasure, then then why why should it be guilty? I, ah, yes. Going back to what you were talking I about. I just with your read. Brother. Okay, I just stayed up all night. So this is something that nobody knows. That I just stayed up all night listening to the most recent Jim Butcher book which is the harry dresden uh wizard detective book okay which is <laughs> you stayed up all night i stayed up all night i had about 45 minutes of sleep it must have been work it, worth it <laughs> yeah it was it was i mean it was just ridiculous escapism i i, I just couldn't yeah i started by not being able to sleep and then right, i started it, listening to this book and then i got oh, caught up in the now. book yeah i get caught up in in narratives they yeah. carry me away and i lose track of time Okay, I have to ask you because I have to, this is driving me crazy. Have a half a glass of water? What are you talking about, Alice? <laughs> so this is from The Last Post, which is my daily satirical news podcast set in an alternate dimension that started on the 1st of January this year. And the premise is that I, Alice Fraser, in this dimension have been receiving these podcasts in my email inbox that are from another dimension with an Alice Fraser who does this daily show. So she's talking about the news in that dimension. Uh -huh. uh, among other things, because it's a daily show, we need to fund it with ads. And so we have an ad section that includes a number of fake ads because I feel uncomfortable in some ways with consumer capitalism. So I do these fake ads. And one of the ads that you will always hear in the ad section is there will be at least one ad for half a glass of water and okay. so, so I just it was just a challenge that I put to myself of whether whether I could find a different and unique way to advertise something completely innocuous half a glass of water it's never the wrong idea 366 <laughs> days of this year so by the end of this year I should have 366 different ads for half a glass of water <laughs> Your brain is fascinating to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. I, I, I have to Why go with that. Why not challenge yourself, right? <laughs> well, you definitely are doing that. All right. So this one, things are more complicated than you think it is. And that's a good thing. Everything is more complicated than you think it is. And this is 
a thread that runs through my comedy, it runs through everything that I do and the way that I understand the world right now. They did this really interesting study in, I think, Stanford University about people's certainties and it was reflecting on the way that people are so politically entrenched right now. But they said to people, do you understand traffic lights or toasters or, you know, any number of things? They asked them a fairly straightforward question. Do you understand whatever it is, polling booths, and people would say, yes, at quite high rates. Yeah, I know that, I understand that, I understand light bulbs, or I understand, yeah. you know, how people get elected, or anything, uh, how, what a judge is. Yeah. Um, and then they would say, well, explain it. <laughs> oh, no. Tell me how it works. Oh, no. And a huge, again, the moment you asked people to explain something that they thought they understood, they realised that they didn't understand it because everything is more complicated than you think it is. That's so true. You know, why, why, doesn't, why is this person late to this thing? Well, why, why did the train not run on time? Why, did, why is this person like that? Or it, It's always more complicated than you think it is. It's always more interesting than you think it is. It's always things unfold sort of fractally and that is a great thing and a fascinating thing about the universe everything is more intricate and beautiful and awful and complex than it looks at first glance and if you approach the world like that yeah i think you do better well you definitely are a knowledge seeker that's for sure i mean you can in everything you do you just want to learn and give and figure out a different way i was just on a two-day workshop and they were saying okay this is how you're, you're successful you can't just be an expert you have to be a visionary but then they didn't explain what a visionary was and everyone's like okay so now what are the steps to being a visionary and you know what the guy's answer was you have to come up with something that google can't answer and i was like okay <laughs> that's a good way of looking at it come up with something that google can't answer Alice, we, we have to wrap up here. I could go on forever with you. Thank you so much for being on. It's been so fun. How can they reach you? How do you want them to reach you? Uh, I have Patreon, patreon.com slash Alice Fraser, and that has all uh, links to all five, I think, now of my specials in various formats, podcasts or videos that, that are available in various places, and also to my podcast, Tea with Alice, and my podcast... The last post so and and all my various other thing my audible documentaries and everything everything's there if you go to patreon.com slash alice fraser or alicefraser.com that's a kind of a jumping off point to the various branches of my wandering mind yeah so i always ask everyone i love words i love the power of words and i love moving so i'm gonna ask you if you could just say one word that you would like to embody in the next 30 days, what would that word be? Focused. Focused. Ah, dramatic pause. Focused. I like that. I, I, was, I was torn between options. <laughs> no, focus. I like that one. All right. Is there anything you want to say to the people here that you haven't gotten in, Alice? Uh, no, it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you for having me on. I'm sorry with my underslept ramblings, uh, if anything was incoherent. Everything uh, was coherent and then some. Well, uh, look after yourselves and the people around you, I guess. I like that. We'll end on that now. All right, my let's keep it real people. I know you're going to say that Alice Frazier definitely kept it real it's going to be one of your favorites i know you had goosebumps while listening to her because i do check her out please watch savage and you know what i'm going to say until next time toodles thanks for listening be sure to share and subscribe if you enjoyed the show and remember keep spreading the positive